let's now extend our work into three dimensions. The time derivatives don't change their sense. They're um, derivatives in time at what goes on at a point, and that's no problem. But the space derivatives do matter. Uh, what were once derivatives on x now have to become gradients, and what were once uh, second derivatives now will become Laplace operators. So to extend the wave in equation into 3D, uh, we need here where the second derivatives on space are involved to have the Laplacian. Uh, it's this um, inverted delta, some people call it a nabla del. Um, and it's on the pressure. Now previously we had carried primes on this, but now we're going to drop the primes. That's a convention that uh, people in acoustics follow. So I won't try to rewrite history here. So we don't have the primes anymore on our pressure perturbations. That's because everybody knows what the game is, that the only pressures of relevance are these perturbed pressures. Um, the term that has a time derivative is unchanged, and so then this becomes the three dimensional wave equation. The Laplacian itself is sort of an averaging uh, operator. It's an interesting thing. Um, uh, when we get into equations that don't have time uh, quantities on them, then it tends to give you elliptic uh, operators that are uh, nice, smooth operators. Currently, though, we do have uh, what would you call a hyperbolic differential equation as long as the time derivatives are in here. Um, Okay, so C is our um, propagation speed, so-called speed of sound. P is really what we used to call P prime. A very special case in acoustics is that of the harmonic wave, both in space and time. Uh, this is a kind of sound impulse put out by a, a loudspeaker giving a pure tone, let's say. Uh, we know that actual sound waves are combinations of various frequencies, but if we can handle a single such frequency at a time, then we can generally solve the problem. Some people call this solving the problem in the frequency domain, and it means that you do concentrate on specific frequencies uh, and then superpose. The superposition is valid because of linearity. Now, um, if we're going to do that, one way to do it is do separation of variables on space and time. Here we have our original pressure perturbation over here. We've dropped the prime on it. It's a spatial perturbation and then a complex exponential in time. If you want to get the effect of a traveling wave, you can use a complex uh, spatial distribution here. I'm using, uh, temporarily at least, this tilde over the spatial part of the pressure because it's not really the same function as the one over here. Uh, an interesting thing then is, if you look at the second derivative of pressure, because you've got the um, exponential time behavior, the two derivatives cough out i omega squared. i is the imaginary number. When you square it, you get minus 1, which shows here. Uh, the f frequency is squared. And then you have a quantity here, which really is the original pressure. So you get that the uh, second derivative of this field variable is minus omega squared times the field variable itself. When we put this into the wave equation, remember there was a location here and it actually is where these terms are. Uh, we are then bringing in the frequency squared and the uh, spatial part of the pressure distribution. There's also the minus change. This minus sign comes in and changes the sign from what was once minus. And so the wave equation has become the so-called Helmholtz equation in honor of uh, one of the big names in, in acoustics. Might have called it the Rayleigh equation, but there's already a bunch of those. Uh, so uh, this is our equation. Now another trick is in acoustics that in the textbooks and the manuals and so on, people tend to drop the tilde at this point. And so you have to be aware that the uh, time part of this equation has been extracted and simplified and appears only now in the frequency. So this is a frequency domain uh, equation that's valid at a certain frequency omega. 
Another tidying up that's done is to use omega over C and call it the wave number, K. And that is done here. And so you end up with a very simple equation, but it's got a lot of uh, insight and intuition built in. First of all, that this is, a, this is really a perturbed spatial distribution of pressure. And then that this wave number has the frequency built into it that gives you something about the uh, dominant excitation in the problem. It's got the speed of sound built into it, which tells you something about the medium. Now, this Helmholtz equation has to have boundary conditions to um, choose among all the different possible pressure fields that might satisfy the field equation. And uh, as we've mentioned before, you do that through combinations of giving surface velocities, surface pressures, and then some combinations of impedance and velocities. I have another figure on that coming up next. I think now you see it's appropriate to have boundary conditions that occur on pressure and derivatives of pressure because that's what our field equation now has. Um, so uh, I've discussed these earlier, but uh, the uh, most important boundary condition really is the velocity boundary condition and that's taken to be the default in problems where if there's zero um, velocity condition, that's like a hard wall, you get a perfect reflection off of that. Um, also, many times, uh, not only do you have that passive type of boundary condition that's so dominant, but you also have active velocity specified when you have a relatively heavy body like an automobile engine. And suppose you know the, um, the motion on the surface of the engine, then you can solve an uncoupled problem where you just presume the air isn't going to change the engine's vibrations very much and only the converse is true, that the vibration of the engine affects the air. Uh, and then you use those surface velocities as the input to the acoustic program. So velocity, both passive and active boundary conditions are really important. Pressure is probably used less often. Uh, you might think it would be used more, but uh, it really isn't. If um, there's sometimes pressure release, if you have an intersection, say, between water and air, where the pressure in the water will be presumed to go to zero at that boundary, that's one possibility. Um, you might think there might be a pressure condition when you have an opening on a closed body. Um, for instance, there is something called a Helmholtz resonator. We have a dominant cavity effect, but there's some opening to the outside world. Uh, you might think, well, you'd set pressure equal to ambient pressure out there. Well, more often that's done as an impedance match, and then even then there's some question where you do that. So I think the impedance is probably the second most important boundary condition. And, uh, Often it's on a surface that has some acoustic treatment and therefore an incoming pressure wave uh, is modified to some extent. Some of the energy is absorbed, it's not all reflected, and then that's usually given in the term of an equation with a complex acoustic impedance Z. And so the pressure and the velocity are linearly related and these are done in complex arithmetic. Lastly, if you have something like the padded surface of an automobile uh, ceiling, uh, then you get possibly a case where the experimentalists know what the velocity of that roof of the car is, but yet it's a moving surface with some acoustic treatment. And that's why it's important to be able to do a simultaneous velocity and impedance condition, and those are blended together. Commercial packages for numerical acoustics have several capabilities. Some of them include finite element acoustic solutions, some include boundary element solutions. Most of the conventional general purpose structural finite element programs now have added acoustics and can handle uh, the finite element formulation. That's uh, known to be uh, helpful in cavity problems and there's a lot of work in the automotive industry being done with conventional structural codes that are modified. But um, the modern trend is toward boundary elements because of a saving in manpower on the uh, meshing. You can have either the direct method or the indirect method and we'll have lectures on each of these. 
Um, the direct method, generally speaking, is a one-sided type of um, element in which you have the acoustic field sensed only on that side. The indirect method involves the acoustic field on both sides of a panel and works in terms of the jump on either side. As generally formulated, the finite element method would have many more equations involved because you have to fill a volume with elements. However, those matrices involved would be banded and symmetric, so you have the, the good news and the bad news. The direct method here might have either symmetric or unsymmetric matrices. The matrices will be smaller in that they have uh, fewer degrees of freedom, but unfortunately will be filled, or that is typically um, fully populated. The indirect method can be made uh, to become symmetric in form, and that's a help uh, making the solution simpler. So let's have a showdown between finite elements and boundary elements. Um, there are three main differences. In the finite element method, the entire domain must be di discretized. Now, there is something called an infinite element or a wave element that's been developed in finite elements. These are not widely used yet. There's some uh, approximation involved, uh, but there is a way to get around this and to do exterior fields, although uh, a little complicated at present. But generally speaking, finite element analysis fills the volume with elements. Um, boundary element methods, you only need to do the two-dimensional surface that bounds your problem. Uh, and the difference in those two is often a manpower difference rather than uh, machine uh, related because it's easier to develop surface models. It's much easier to work in two dimensions than three. The next point does have to do with exterior problems. Um, currently in practice today, it's, it's common practice to only um, do interior acoustic problems with finite elements. Um, but boundary elements are used both for interior and uh, radiation problems, exterior problems. The research in the future might change this because there are some uh, infinite elements and so-called wave elements that are meant to extend from a finite body out to infinity. So there's some promise there. There's some very good researchers working in that area and um, uh, I don't know what the future will bring, but at present, just as an operating practice, I think you'd want to make that distinction. So, for instance, the automotive companies are using finite elements quite a bit for interior cavity problems uh, for the inside of the automobile. The other thing, uh, point three here, has to do with the symmetry and bandedness of equations, where finite element matrices, although being large, have both of those nice properties. But boundary element matrices are fully populated and possibly non-symmetric. So it's wise to take, uh, pay attention to those things. Um, they affect the solution cost. Uh, fortunately, it is possible in boundary elements to do what's called zoning, and that does help and, and give sort of a bandedness to a problem which uh, intrinsically has uh, sets of equations that are fully coupled. It helps you break the uh, solutions into um, disjoint sets of equations. In our problem session, I'm going to propose three different solutions for our wave equation and see if these are uh, allowable pressure fields. Case A is a cosine in space and a sine in time with a coefficient A out front, which would be an amplitude coefficient. This would often be used in a real form, and you might recognize then that this would be what's called a standing wave. It would have um, cosines in, in space that would change um, their sine sense, but, but tend to just oscillate back and forth then in this uh, pattern, which is an envelope with fixed nodal points here. 
The second one is a general traveling wave. In this case, uh, the shape of the wave in space could be arbitrary. The wave will be moving to the left with speed A. Thirdly, you could have this complex exponential form both in time and in space. Normally a person would interpret in most mechanics problems that it would be the real part of this pressure that would be of interest and would lead to real displacement fields in a structure. We'll see how this tracks through the uh, wave equation. Let's look at our case A. This was the real standing wave. And if we substitute that into the wave equation, uh, we recognize the uh, second space derivative, the second time derivative, the minus sign, the, uh, the c squared appearing. Remember the c captures the um, material properties of the medium. So we're proposing a pressure disturbance with a cosine wave form and a sine time dependence. Now the cosine in the um, x direction survives these two derivatives bringing out some constants and then bringing the cosine term back again on, and that is replicated on the other side where there is no space derivative. Likewise with the um, time function uh, there's no derivative on time on the left so it survives and on the right the two derivatives just cough out the minus omega squared because two derivatives of sine omega t by a t does that. You go through the cosine and then the minus sine again. You don't want this equation to hold true trivially just for some instant of time. Therefore, let's uh, cancel the uh, sine omega t and you don't want it to hold just at one point in space so uh, and we see it's in balance in that sense both in time and space so we'll cancel the space terms. You're then left with some constants here that must balance out in order to give us this uh, zero on the right side. And this is the expression that's obtained. Now, since the speed of sound is constant in a medium, an acoustic medium, this gives us a relation between the frequency and the wavelength. And so that's stated down here that the wavelength is, is inversely related to the frequency. Now, of course you say, well, of course, but in my structural dynamics background, we were able to take a flexible wall and, and propose that the flexible wall move with any wavelength and any frequency. But notice what you've got here. This is an acoustic wave that characterizes the medium itself. And the springiness and the elasticity of the medium are caught up in the constant uh, speed of sound. We're not able to maintain a pressure wave in air unless the frequency and the wavelength are related like this to the speed of sound. So in other words, to get a standing wave in this form, basically you have to resonate a cavity is what, what it boils down to. You've got to get a reflection of waves off the two boundaries. We're going to go into this later, but it's, it's a little bit different than in uh, structural mechanics, than in vibration of, of uh, bodies like, um, like um, sheet metal and so on that you, you consider as affecting the fluid. This time the fluid itself is resonating, so it's, a, uh, it's got its own time constants built in. Now, you can also put this in frequency form uh, in hertz rather than radians per second, and that's a trivial change where uh, omega over 2 pi is set equal to the conventional frequency. Um, some people would rather have frequency in radian mesh measure here, and um, so you can call it circular frequency or, or any other term, but uh, often people would rather work with the frequency in hertz. Case B is the arbitrary traveling wave. We actually did this in the lecture as well, where we took this general traveling wave form. It's a wave traveling to the left, and when you do the two derivatives, you uh, pick up the uh, F double primes here and here. 
um, the amplitude can cancel on both sides and then the arbitrary functional form can cancel on the two sides and you get one minus a squared over c squared has to equal zero or um, you must have your a equals c so this will only work if you choose your pressure field to be moving um, at the speed of sound now you can either go plus or minus you can probably see here that uh, a could either be plus or minus and this will work out so you can either have uh, a left traveling or a right traveling wave case c was the complex form and uh, we'll again substitute that into the wave equation uh, the exponentials will uh, retain their shape when they're differentiated everybody likes exponentials because when you take derivatives they come back again sort of like a cat with nine lives except exponentials have infinite lives under infinite attacks by derivatives after taking the derivatives uh, there are some constants brought out both on the space and time derivatives but um, you again get a repeated functional form where the time terms can be canceled the space term can be canceled the amplitude can be canceled and then you're left with these constants now these constants have to be true and and if the uh, wave equation is to be satisfied in some um, space uh, these have to hold throughout we view the speed of sound as a known constant so again we get a relation between the wavelength and the frequency of oscillation so you can't get this kind of uh, pattern of pressure except at certain um, relations between wavelength and frequency uh, this is due, of course, to the inherent springiness of the medium and uh, what it requires. If, if there is to be a constant wave speed, then um, this has to be the relation. Finally, I do a, a short trick here to um, show the same thing, that if you view that complex exponential uh, in a product form here where you sum the exponentials, then it looks like a general function um, of a traveling wave. In fact, knowing that we substituted such a general function as this one previously and found that the wave speed where I've already put C here had to hold then we immediately see by analogy what the wave speed has to be and that gives you directly then the relation between wavelength and frequency as we got before that finishes our problem session and so the following lectures will be on numerical acoustics